Welcome to Studio 51. I'm Jason Weider. And I'm Mary Sugden. Studio 51 is a weekly news magazine produced by Loyola University students in Chicago. We've got a great show for you with a special report on immigration, some health tips, our weekly food pick, and of course, our point-counterpoint debating the U.S. Postal Service. And did I mention sports and those Red Hawk Blackhawks? That and more. But first, let's get a news roundup from Studio 51's Newsbeat reporter, Kristen Nimmel. Thanks, guys. The big news this week was all about the money and the Jacksons. Former Representative Jesse Jackson Jr. and his wife Sandy Jackson pled guilty in a Washington, D.C. court. Jackson pled guilty for spending $750,000 in campaign funds for personal use. Former Alderman Sandy Jackson pled guilty for underreporting their income on taxes. The couple will be sentenced this summer. Well, it's all out there now. A White House draft of an immigration bill has been leaked to the media. President Obama stressed this bill is a backup proposal if Senate talks fail. Both proposals are considering immigration reform that would include a pathway to citizenship and a crackdown on businesses employing undocumented immigrants. Another major component of immigration reform is a mandate requiring immigrants to speak English. Studio 51's Wendy Esparza has a closer look on immigrants trying to learn English. Whether booking a doctor's appointment or applying for jobs, learning how to speak English is necessary. Now I'm a resident, and probably in ten, five years we can be a citizen. citizen. So maybe the test, the immigration, take in English. So that way I learn English too. Ernestina emigrated to the U.S. from Mexico 23 years ago. Four days of the week, she meets with her classmates for three hours to learn English, here at Centro Romero. This community-based organization offers different programs for the refugee immigrant population, including English as a Second Language, or ESL, classes. Here, they learn about grammar, how to use different tenses, or practice speaking with each other. And just like anything worth doing, it's not easy. The more difficult part is uh, how to um, by writing and pronunciation. <laughs> a recent study showed immigrants in the U.S. speak over 300 languages, just as diverse as this class, according to their instructor. This, like last term, it was more older generation people that were here for a while that just never learned English or haven't, haven't learned it in the classroom setting, so we're working with that level. So housewives, people like cooks, or construction workers, that's a large part of my class. And now some people are like younger, um, younger parents that have been here less time, know more English, but also still want to come and get more instruction. For some immigrants, it may be optional, but for those like Ernestina who are on a path towards citizenship, learning English may be a requirement. We are in America, we need to speak English. For Studio 51, I'm Wendy Esparza. In other news, Lance Armstrong has announced he won't be meeting with the U.S. Anti-Doping Agency. If Armstrong would provide doping information on other athletes, Armstrong's lifetime ban could be reduced to eight years. Closer to Chicago, we're off to the races. Well, not exactly. The Bank of America Chicago Marathon registration has been put on hold through Sunday. On Tuesday, online registration for the marathon became plagued with glitches. Race officials say about 15,000 spots still remain. Mayor Rahm Emanuel vows to take a bite out of spending for Taste of Chicago. Last year's event lost over $1 million despite cuts being made. While attendance and revenue were both up, costs had also risen. Emanuel hasn't mentioned eliminating the event, but urges for cost cutting. Finally this week, it's a night that will dazzle and delight. That's right, the 85th Academy Awards will air this Sunday. Some of the big movies nominated include Argo, Lincoln, and Zero Dark Thirty. Be sure to tune in for the film industry's biggest night. This has been your news roundup. For Studio 51, I'm Kristen Immel. Thanks, Kristen. A lot of good movies out right now. Mary, what's your pick for Best Picture? You know, my favorite is Silver Linings Playbook. What about you? You know, I'm pulling for Argo, but I guess we're going to have to find out on Sunday. We'll have to wait and see. Well, let's turn our attention now to some Loyola news. This week's Phoenix Breakdown focuses on this front page article concerning the alleged sexual assault of two Loyola students by a Loyola freshman. 
Phoenix News editor Tyler Langan covered the preliminary hearing and joins us now to talk about it. Welcome, Tyler. Thank you. So to start off, I just want to give some background um, information for some of our viewers. So can you kind of summarize what the Phoenix reported um, allegedly took place last month with this case? I'm sure uh, back in January, just, uh, the end of January, Colin Kennedy was arrested by Chicago police um, in connection with alleged rape, uh, rapes against these two uh, Loyola sophomores in Fordham Hall. Um, he was arrested, um, he, and then he was released on um, bond that his parents posted. Um, flew back to California, and then he came back um, for his preliminary hearing on um, just on Tuesday. Okay, so on this Tuesday, the, like as you said, the preliminary hearing at the Cook County Building, and it was Judge Brown presiding, and both the prosecution and defense were there, and you were there for all this. So can you kind of fill us in and, and let us know what what happened at this hearing and what it was like? Well, the hearing lasted about an hour. It's a preliminary hearing. That's where the state's attorney, the prosecution, asks would ask these girls uh, questions, and then there would be a cross examination where Kennedy's lawyer would ask the girls questions. Um, Kennedy didn't speak at all, and the girls had to answer questions such as why did they keep in touch with Kennedy after the alleged incident, um, you know, how much these girls had to drink on each night. Um, so they answered these questions. It was really emotional. Um, uh, there were other reporters in the room. Um, it was, it was very emotional because um, these girls had difficulty, you know, coming forward. They talked about how they wanted everything to stay normal between them and their group of friends that included mm -hmm. Kennedy and how difficult it was to come forward, but they said they didn't want it to happen to anyone else. At one point, one girl almost fainted. Um, two men rushed forward um, with chairs so that she could sit down for a couple minutes. Wow. Sounds like a really intense situation. It was, yeah. So this is somewhat of an unusual case as far as evidence goes, because typically in sexual assault cases, uh, a rape kit is used to collect evidence. Did either of the uh, alleged victims consult medical attention to do this? Um, they came forward on, I believe it was January 26th to campus safety, and they were advised to go to a hospital to get um, an STD screening and a pregnancy test. Um, both came back negative. But as far as the rape kit goes, it was so late. Um, it was, I think, a week and a half, maybe even two weeks afterwards. So there was no DNA evidence to link um, Kennedy to um, these rapes. So then moving on from here, what are the next, um, what will be the next processes that Kennedy will be going through and where, where does this case go from here? There is another hearing that Kennedy will have um, in March, and be, uh, about mid-March, I think it's March 12th or 13th, and um, I believe they will set the trial date. I don't believe that's the actual trial. Um, so then the Phoenix will have um, someone there covering it and we will keep you updated from there. All right, sounds good. Well, I'm sure we'll be hearing from you in the future. All right. Tyler Langan, the news editor of the Phoenix, thank you again for being here with us. Thank you. Back to you, Jason. This week's Health Beat talks about migraines, something a lot of us deal with, including myself. Here's Stephanie Skelnick. If you've ever experienced a headache or a migraine pain, you know at times it can be debilitating. Sometimes medicine works, other times it doesn't. The most obvious cure? Don't get a headache. Knowing what causes your headaches can decrease your chances of getting one. WebMD says some of the things that can generate headaches are stress, weather, and certain scents. Some unusual causes can be what you wear in your hair, cheese, and even cold cuts. To view the complete list of surprising headache triggers, head over to WebMD.com. You might want to think twice before you have that next drink. A new study in the American Journal of Public Health shows about 20,000 people die from cancer caused by drinking each year. That is almost 4% of all cancer-related deaths. The American Cancer Society recommends that people limit their intake to no more than two drinks per day for men and one drink for women. And finally, allergy season is right around the corner, and the, and the 40 million people who suffer from them know that the sickness they can cause. If you are like me and willing to try new things, that can ease the suffering, then acupuncture might be the study, might be for you. A study published in the Annuals of Inter Internal Medicine say that acupuncture might help relieve itchy eyes and sneezing. Although findings suggest the placebo effect may have been a part for the relief for some patients, further research is still needed. But if you are looking for something a little different than conventional medicine, the author of the study recommends trying it out. For The Health Beat, I'm Stephanie Skelnick. Coming up, sports in 51 seconds with a look at this week's sports action, and our super fan has his analysis on the Blackhawks. And you won't want to miss our foodie's mouthwatering critique. Stay tuned. So you can't save money? That's easy as pie. Brown bag and lunch instead of going out. Have to take a second to take some excitement. Times, my head is a week times <coughs> 10 years is 21,000 bucks. That's a lot of lettuce. Small changes today, big bucks tomorrow. Feedthepig.org. Welcome back to Studio 51. Thanks for staying with us. 
Get your stopwatch ready for 51 Seconds of Sports with Stephanie Sanford. Thanks, Jason Mary. This week in sports, things are looking up for Chicago fans. The Chicago Blackhawks have been able to maintain their winning streak. The Blackhawks won 4-3 against the Vancouver Canucks on Tuesday. The Hawks have been able to match the NHL record of 16 consecutive games without a regulation loss. The Blackhawks play at home tonight against the San Jose Sharks. For all the Bulls fans out there, Derrick Rose is finally back to full contact practice after having knee surgery. Rose had his first 5-on-5 five -five scrimmage of this season on Monday. Rev up your engines, NASCAR fans. The Daytona 500 season opener starts this Sunday. Dan Patrick is getting the crowds excited by becoming the first woman to win the pole in NASCAR's top sprint cup series. What an amazing feat. Today's superfan Sean Keenahan talks more about the Blackhawks and the recent injury to Marion Hossa. Thanks, Stephanie. As the Chicago Blackhawks attempt to set the record for the best regular season start in NHL history, they may have to continue without superstar forward Marion Hossa in their lineup. Hossa, currently ranked number three on the team in scoring, is an outstanding two-way player on the ice and has played a pivotal role in the Blackhawks' early success this season. After scoring two goals in the second period of the Blackhawks' win over the Phoenix Coyotes on Tuesday, Hossa left the game after receiving an illegal forearm to the back of the head from Coyotes forward Yannick Hansen. The league announced that Hansen would only be suspended for a single game and, according to the NHL's Department of Player Safety, is forced to pay a fine of $7,297, the equivalent of Hansen's one-game average salary. You may recall that last April, Hossa suffered a season-ending concussion after a vicious hit from the Phoenix Coyotes' Rafi Torres in the 2012 playoffs. The league handed Torres a 21-game suspension for the hit, a decision that would cost Torres over $21,341 per game. Several factors come into play when the NHL determines the consequences of a suspension, including the amount of time a player will miss, the level of the injury's severity, and the past history of the player at fault. Although Hansen has a clean history in terms of suspensions and illegal hits, the league should consider attempts to target vulnerable players returning from recent injuries when determining the consequences of suspensions. The fact that Hansen targeted Hosa's head, knowing that Hosa had just returned from a severe concussion, brings literal meaning to the term headhunter. Hansen was given a two-minute minor penalty for the forearm and claimed that the hit to Hosa was unintentional and merely a hockey play as he was going for the puck. Hosa practiced with the team on Thursday. However, the Blackhawks do not have any updates on his status. All of us here at Studio 51 wish Hosa a speedy recovery and continued success in the shortened 2013 NHL season. For Studio 51, I'm your superfan, Sean Keenahan. Each week, a Studio 51 reporter picks a local restaurant, samples the cuisine, and files a foodie critique. Our foodie this week is Wendy Esparza. Wendy, what do you have for us? Thanks, Mary. This week we're going to Spain, or I should say the closest restaurant to it in Chicago called Café Ibérico, which serves tapas and regional specialties from all over this country. And what are tapas? Tapas are small portions of any dish perfect for sharing and affordable. Their prices vary from $2 to $7. I recommend the patatas bravas, delicious spicy potatoes with a creamy tomato sauce, or pincho de pollo, a chicken brochette with caramelized onions and rice. For the main dish, you cannot leave without ordering a paella, a typical Spanish rice dish. They have different variations of it, including a vegetarian option. The Iberian paella comes with seafood, chicken, and pork, all baked in its own pan with safran sauce. Servers will warn you that it's a 30 to 40 minute wait for a paella, but it's worth it. And while you wait, tempting as it may be, don't fill up with the restaurant's complimentary bread that you can dip in fruity olive oil. And because no trip to Spain would be complete without sangria, when you go, make sure to order a pitcher or half a pitcher of the traditional drink made with red wine and chopped fruit. So where is this place? Café Iberico is at the corner of La Salle and Chicago, just a few blocks from here at 739 North La Salle Drive. This weekend, hop on the 66 bus towards Austin or walk a few blocks and treat yourself and someone else to an exquisite Spanish meal. I'm Wendy Esparza, Studio 51 News. Coming up, this week's Point Counterpoint on Saturday Mail and a special report on the Chicago Auto Show done Loyola style. G morning, sunshine. Wakey, wakey. Text me. I think it might be one of the Are your parents home later? We can hang. LUV, love you. JK. Holla back. 
Holla back. Holla back. <laughs> Are you with your friends? That's lame. We're in a huge fight right now. XO. What'd you dream about? Something I did? Are you on your way to the mall? I'm lonely. Nude pics. Send me some. Text me. Welcome back to Studio 51. I'm Mary Sugden. And I'm Jason Weeder. The U.S. Postal Service has announced they are eliminating Saturday mail come this August. This week's Point Counterpoint debates whether this is a good thing. Here's Studio 51's Caitlin Wilson and Dominique Stem. With the rise of internet, email, and paperless communication, Americans are sending less snail mail. According to the United States Postal Service, first-class mail delivery has dropped 26% since 2007, and they have lost $20 billion in the last five years alone. In an effort to save money, the Postal Service announced on February 6th that they plan to halt Saturday mail delivery by August. A survey released February 13th says that 80% of Americans support the reduced mail schedule. But is it really a good idea? Dominique, what do you think? Well, Caitlin, I agree with the Postal Service's decision just like the rest of America. In the fiscal year 2012, they lost $15 billion alone. About half of the mail delivered is junk mail. People just do not use paper anymore and do not need the mail to find out everything that's going on. Between the internet, television, and other media outlets, whatever you need to know can be accessed almost immediately without waiting for a piece of paper. It's more cost efficient on the government and it's, more, it's better for the environment. Okay, I understand where you're coming from. The internet and media have made things a lot easier. But what about people who do not have regular access to the internet? Should they have to go a whole day without access to their information? Government-sponsored mail delivery dates all the way back to 1775. The Founding Fathers wanted a way for the young and rural country to stay connected. The mail was delivered to almost everyone, six days a week, rain or shine, at affordable prices. Eliminating Saturday delivery goes against everything about its democratic roots. Their employees will have to work longer Mondays to make up for the time lost not working Saturday, and they could make less money. Even worse, the Postal Service will need to employ fewer people if they cut Saturday delivery. This means less jobs for Americans. Um, that sounds like it would make sense, but I talked to a few postal workers and they seem to support the new schedule. As a mail carrier, you get two days off a week automatically. Now you have Saturday off. The rest of the work schedule stays the same. You will still get your same 40 plus hour work week. The only complaint would be that on Monday it would be a harder work day, but I'm sure that having a whole extra day off will compensate. And like stated before, the government just does not have the means to pay for a six day delivery schedule. Besides, who pays bills on Saturday? I don't know, but I'm sure my grandma would appreciate a Saturday letter. Maybe it's time grandma gets an iPhone. Maybe. Either way, they will still be delivering packages on Saturday, so grandma can still send me some cookies. I'm Caitlin Wilson. And I'm Dominique Stem. This has been Point Counterpoint. Join us next week as we heat up or cool down another controversial topic. Back to you guys. Point Counterpoint takes on a new issue each week, but we want to know what you think. Email us at studio51news at gmail.com or you can tweet us at Studio 51 News. Finally, did you take in any of the Chicago Auto Show? The show had record-breaking attendance, including three Loyola students who captured the show in an award-winning video. Studio 51 congratulates Stephen Abriani, Olivia Adamovich, and Grace Heidegg. We end our show with a quick peek at the video which won the 2013 Festival of Media Arts Award from the Broadcast Education Association. Well, that's our show for this week. I'm Mary Sugden. And I'm Jason Weider. We'll see you next week. Now we're here today at the Chicago Auto Show, and if you just take a look around, there's just so much here to see and experience. Thank you. Oh my scallywaggers, I'm in heaven. From the beautiful cars to the delicious food and the fun activities everywhere, the Chicago Auto Show it's just a great time for all. Give me a pee.
pizza? Meet me in Germany. German cars, Mercedes. All right, well, if there was music on, I'd be playing. Doo -doo. All right. A lot of bright work, a lot of chrome, um, and a lot of very clean, straight lines. Yeah, she's a beaut, all right. Turbo interior, hydraulic expansion. Got one back home. You could uh, take a spin in it if you'd like. Hello. What's this? I'm at Fiat. I'm at Fiat. Hmm. We're at the 2013 Chicago Auto Show. And here at the Fiat stand, we have some of our latest and greatest Fiat models. Fiat's coming off a great 2012. Our sales were up 120% from 2011, and the momentum continues. Behind me, we have the Fiat 500 Turbo, which adds even more power and performance to the Fiat lineup. Oh, no. Meet me at Audi. Hey, thanks for the pizza earlier. Where do I know you from? Don't you recognize me? Oh my god, you're the girl from the flyer. Yeah. Can you keep up? There's only one way to find out. It is a production.